Well, good morning again. I want to uh, invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. And we are again in chapter 1. We'll be looking at uh, verses 7 through 10. Now, before I read, I also want to encourage you just to remember that if you have questions about the Christian faith, um, anything that you've always wanted to know or just haven't been willing to ask, um, I want you to to feel free to write into our Q&A address. Our Q&A phone number is on the screen. And I'll take about five to seven minutes to answer anonymous questions about Christianity, about the sermon this morning, uh, whatever's really on your heart about it. And uh, again, nobody will know who asks it, but we want people to feel free to ask those questions, uh, questions of doubt, all kinds. Uh, But please be willing to do that as well. So let me pray for us after I'm going to read the text, and then I'll, I'll lead you in prayer. So starting here in verse 7, in him, meaning Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Lord God, we ask that you would lead us in your word, in all understanding by the work of your spirit. I pray for my brother, a friend of mine who is preaching in a pulpit in another place this morning. Would you encourage and strengthen him? Would you help him, Lord, to cling to you as he brings your message? And would you now, Lord, help us to hear you and to follow you, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, uh, mystery. There's a mystery here in these verses. And typically we tend to think of mysteries as things that are uh, hidden, some crime that's committed, something that needs to be solved. We think of something that's disappeared or someone who's disappeared. But in the Bible, mysteries hit a little different. They aren't about the thing which has disappeared, but the thing which has appeared. It's about the thing that you are working to understand and explain that you can't explain. It's the lock to which you don't have a key, but you're, you're trying the tumblers, right? I, I think of ant farms. Sounds like you're great, you know, non sequitur, but let me explain. I think of ant farms, here's why. They have this little closed system And they also have a mystery, and that mystery is that try as they might, tunneling through, doing everything that they do, they can't escape. They will bump up against the reality that there is glass that kind of holds them in. That is the idea of mystery as the Bible describes it, a thing which is evident and yet hidden, that's hard to understand. And in the text, we're going to see that this morning, that there is this closed system, this hard thing to get, and how are we to understand it? Now, this, doesn't just, this isn't just kind of a metaphysical question. All of us deal in, in some kind of mystery, something that we feel we can't overcome, some reality that's right in front of us, and we can't move past it. Whether you're a scientist or whatever, or whether you're just a person that likes to party because you can't figure out what to do with your life. Uh, Albert Camus wrote a book called The Fall, which is devastating in many ways, but it really has a keen insight to the human heart. And he describes a bit of a mystery for one of the characters in it. I just want to read to you what he writes about this process of trying to understand and unravel the mystery. It says, I was at ease in everything, to be sure, but at the same time satisfied with nothing. Each joy made me desire another. On occasion, I danced for nights on end, ever matter about people and life. At times, late on those nights when the dancing, the slight intoxication, my wild enthusiasm, everyone's violent unrestraint would fill me with a tired and overwhelmed rapture. It would seem to me at the breaking point of fatigue and for a second's flash that at last I understood the secret. Until... Music stopped, and the lights went out. Later on, he talks about partying for nights on end and waking with the bitter taste of the mortal state. That desiring to pursue what will most 
make you happy? What will unlock life for you? All of us, to some degree, face that challenge, whether you're a Christian or not, whether you're a believer this morning or a skeptic, that it's evident that life isn't going to unfold in all the ways you want it to. You are challenged. And here, Paul says that there's an even bigger kind of mystery, and that that mystery begins to be understood by a kind of wisdom, by a way of living, that Christians have a skill that we'll talk about in a minute, and that that skill comes from our redemption, that it somehow accomplishes a way for us to understand the greatest of all mysteries. So this morning, we're going to talk about what that wisdom looks like and how it relates to this great mystery that Paul is talking about. We'll talk about this redeemed kind of wisdom that is overall. We'll also hear about the way in which it's under all. And we'll also hear about the way in which it joins all. So over and under and joining all things. So first, verses uh, six through eight, you have this kind of point at which there's this truth that is above all things. He begins here in verse six, uh, I'm sorry, in verse seven, in him, in Christ, again, that's the theme you're gonna hit again and again. In him, we, us, together, have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of of our trespasses, right? If you're used to the, the, the kind of King James language in the Lord's Prayer, you've said trespasses before, and here's where that really comes from, that idea of walking wrongly, okay? We have this, he says. In him, we have this redemption. But then he says that it, actually there's this lavishing on us, this lavishing of all wisdom and all insight. Now, He's not saying that as soon as you become redeemed, you know how to resole a shoe or cycle the landing gear on a 747, right? That's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying that you suddenly have everything, every piece of knowledge kind of in your brain. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that this wisdom that we receive by being redeemed, by understanding our redemption is, a, is, a, is at the root of all of life that the skill of being a redeemed woman or man is at the heart of living the right kind of life. Now, you might wonder, okay, in wisdom, in the scriptures, we're not talking about knowledge necessarily. We're talking about skill. Everywhere in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, when you read the word wisdom, it is a skill for godly living, okay? Not just a skill to show off, like, hey, I can juggle, but a skill for godly living, not knowledge about God that you then use to be arrogant and break people, but knowledge about God and redemption that you then use to unravel the great mystery of God in the world. Wisdom is skill for godly living. And this skill rises out of our salvation. John Frame, the theologian, he puts it this way. He says, the whole word applies to the whole world. Be a student of the scriptures, of your redemption, of the story from beginning to end. Yes, do not let go of your Old Testament, nor of the wisdom literature, nor of the apocalyptic literature, nor of the minor or major prophets, the epistles, the gospels, all of it, beautiful and, and, and part of the building up, the wisdom that allows us to then be invested in all of life. This was Frame's point. All of it comes through this redemption, this wisdom that helps us to live properly. Now, the challenge that Paul's making here is to say that wisdom about redemption is overall, it is the dominating feature of your life. In other words, what you're saying is that my redemption in Christ is the central feature of how I live and who I am. Now that is quite a challenging statement. That your and my redemption is the central feature. Not having kids, I'm sorry not being married to the most wonderful spouse ever, not being the chairman of the board, 
not being the youngest CEO to ever CEO, not having kids that get into a good school, living on a safe street, whatever it is. But redemption supplies this wisdom that is overall. And now it only makes sense. If your soul is saved through this redemption, it has to have some importance beyond just like the metaphysical religious world that you live in, okay? It has to be more important than that. And as a matter of fact, that's kind of the testimony of the last 2,000 years, that redemption coming out into the world has actually changed everything, everything. It's actually the underpinnings, our society now, our morality as a community, not all of it, but the stuff that says, hey, uh, you know, learning things is good and the arts are beautiful and you should do things well for the sake of others and the poor and the hurting should be lifted up and cared for. Those kind of what we call uh, secular liberal identities, those things first arose from Christians living wisely. Let me give you a couple of quotes. Christian Smith, who's a, a philosophy professor at University of Notre Dame, says this, modern sensibilities about love and human rights are riding on the continued currents of some millennia of a cultural inheritance powerfully influenced by Christianity and Judaism. That's what makes these ideals make sense to you. Think about that. If I worry about anything, I worry about this, he says. These moral ideals, loving your neighbor, honoring her human rights, regardless of who they are or where they are, make sense to us now. But if they're based on the cultural inheritance of religion... Will these morals make sense to our grandchildren? Beyond that, professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania, who, as far as I know, isn't a believer, but came to an understanding and an appreciation for Christian morality. Here's what he says about it. Independent of whether you believe in the existence of God, you have to be impressed. I love that. You have to be impressed. Yeah, uh, Leonard Cohen said that once about Jesus too, which I love. Uh, you have to be impressed with the man described as Jesus of Nazareth. At the time of Jesus' life, around 4 BC to 30 AD, child abuse, as noted by one historian, was the crying vice of the Roman Empire. Infanticide was common. Abandonment was common. Hippocrates never mentioned children. Those of you who have taken the Hippocratic Oath, Hippocrates never mentions children. That's because children were property, no different than slaves. But Jesus stood up for children, cared about them, and when those around him typically didn't. This is the impact of redeemed wisdom, a people who are at work in God's world, who have been impacted by their salvation. But here's the thing. It has to be overall. It has to influence everything. It can't be, as you know, C.S. Lewis has said, only moderately important. It has to be more than that. And I'll even put it this way. The first danger to the church, many of us think this regularly, and I understand it because we want the church to succeed. The church is an institution, and so we often worry about pressure from outside, right? But the biggest challenge is, say, relativism outside the church. The way people view culture, and they attack our beliefs, and they say we're fools, or whatever else. I will say that before that's ever a threat, the first danger to the church is actually relativism from within. It's when we, as the church, say that God is willing, that Jesus will accept from us any less than everything. When we believe that we can be a churchgoer on Sunday and live our ethics any way we choose on Monday. And now here's the thing. If you're a skeptic here, and this might not actually offend you at all. And part of the reason is because for you, if you're a skeptic, not really all bought in, you kind of see the foolishness of this thing. You do this on Sunday, why on earth would you apply it at the rest of your life. Why would you ever do that, right? So you show up to church, you do your thing, and then Monday you kind of move on and you live life the way that you've always lived life. I can't, look, I can't blame you. Without investing, without being, without having our wisdom, our way of life, our skill, without having that grow out of redemption, of course the rest of our life isn't going to be changed. Well, the Bible says there's actually no other way than to understand this as an overall kind of wisdom. It has to impact everything, right? It has to change everything. Now, here's a verse that you can write down 
It can be a, a part of your whatever. You can cross-stitch it. I don't know what you, what you do with your favorite verses anyway. Some people like airbrush them on their cars. I don't know if that's a New York thing. But anyway, here's one. Galatians 2.20. Now, some of you are like, I know that one. You're nodding your head. You're making sure the people next to you know it. Others of you have no idea what I'm talking about. That's fine. We printed it for you in the notes in the bulletin, right? But here it is also. Galatians 2.20. This is just a, this is the most rational application of the Christian truth of redemption. The most rational. I have been crucified with Christ, he says. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. This is an entirely consistent view of what redemption should do to us. It doesn't make sense to say, I have been impressed with Christ. He impresses me. That Jesus who died for me, worth considering. It doesn't make sense to say, I'm inspired even by Christ. I'll bet, Charles and I, one of the last things that, we're, that, we're, that we really know what to do with is when someone says, boy, that was very worshipful today. Right? I don't know what that means. Who knows? I was very inspired. Okay. Are you ready to like run through the wall and follow Jesus wherever he leads you? Now that's the good feedback. That's what we want to know. That's what I need to hear for my own good. I need to be willing to do that. God help us if we're just looking to be inspired or fill the tank a little bit this morning. This is, as I've said before, a sanctified carjacking when you show up at worship. This truth is not casual. It overwhelms everything, as Galatians 2 tells us. It must be, it must be over all. It has to be over all. So in that regard, let me just encourage you. This is an aside. If you have atheist or agnostic friends, good for you. Not just because it's great to be able to have communication about the gospel and give you a chance to evangelize, but also because they kind of keep you honest a little bit. They'll keep you honest. They'll force you to evaluate the message that you're sending and the way that you're living life to make sure that your life is consistent with the truth that we're getting here, which is that if you have been redeemed, that you have now tapped into something which is all wisdom, all skill for how we ought to live our life. It is over all. But not just that, it's also under all. Verses 9 and 10, Paul continues, and he says, now, once you've received this wisdom and insight, uh, you, you're also making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things on heaven and on earth. In other words, that this wisdom is such that it is the bottom floor of all reality. It is the thing which makes the world make sense. Now, you might be wondering, there's this really weird word here. It's like... Um, what is it, Kummerspect, that, that, that word for uh, heart bacon in German, right? It's got like 27 uh, consonants and no vowels. Like this word in the Greek is like that. It's used one place. And that word is everything gathered up in the head of Jesus, which is less poetic. Let me also give it to you, not the same word, but the same idea from Paul's letter to Colossians. It's going to be on the screen Colossians 1, 16 through 17, warms my heart every time I see it. This is from my, both my college and my seminary uh, verse. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. You're starting to know the same, same themes. Whether thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And now here's the parallel sentence. And in him all things what? All things hold together. In him, all things finally, finally make sense. In him, all things have a floor. In him, all things have a reason and a hope and a future. It's incredible, that, that mystery that we're longing to understand. In him, we find it. Now, there's a challenge in the New Testament church that Paul's talking about in both Ephesians 
and Galatians, I mean, uh, Ephesians and Colossians, Galatians 2. The challenge was this, that you really had two kinds of people who were coming into the church at this time, in the early church life. You had the, the folks who know what to do. The, the, these are the people who would have known the doxology when you sing it, right? These were the Jews. They, they knew all the, the ritual. They understood uh, uh, the, the law. They, 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 they were conversant with the prophets. They understood these things. They knew how to be reverent. And then you had people walking in who were steeped in Greco-Roman culture, who were walking in just busting up the place, full of joy, but having no idea how to do this new religious thing that they had walked into. They were a, really, truly a bull in a china shop. I mean, they were just walking in there being saved suddenly and rejoicing in the king. And they're showing up next to people who were way too cool for school, who'd done it. Not only that, they were coming into the church and believing that they had an even place with people who had worked their whole lives to be religiously good. Who had done the blood, the sweat, the tears. Who had followed the commands for the most part. And here are these people showing up. You know, probably like you know, showing up at a wedding, you're not properly dressed, you don't know, you've never been to one of these things. You're coming in, they're worshiping God, you want to worship God, you think everybody's happy about it. And then suddenly, the Jews and the Judaizers are saying, until you become like us, you can't follow him. You can't be his. And Paul knows that this is such a serious challenge that the church has to address it at almost every turn. And not only that, not only is it a big challenge in this way, but it's also a big challenge beyond the Jewish and Gentile idea, right? You've got the, the Jew, and then you've got the Gentile, which is everybody who's not Jewish, the nations, the so-ons, the other peoples, okay? Those two people trying to get together to belong to one church, having different heritages, one group of people having done everything right, seemingly, liturgically, ritually, the other group of people just happy to be there. You see this over and over in the scriptures. One of the very least loved, in my experience, and most impactful parables in the New Testament is the parable of the day laborers. The day laborers is the parable where a certain group of people works 11 hours. They do a lot of good work. Then some so-and-so show up who want to do a little bit of work at the 12th hour, and the master says, go on. You go do the work too. And when the hour's over, everyone gets paid the same amount. It's a bitter parable for hard workers. It's a lovely parable for the guy like me who came in from the outside knowing nothing about Christianity, being welcomed at the table. It is difficult to live in the reality that Jesus lays out for us, that Paul then dives into. And he says, this is the way, he's not saying that's how you should run a business, okay? He's saying this is how his kingdom works. The kingdom works this way. And then it's going to be lived out over and over again throughout the New Testament. You're going to hear it again and again. Not Jew or Gentile, but this. Not divided, but this. When you come to the Lord's table, don't fight. Because one person thinks they've done it all right and the other person hasn't. The big challenge, the big mystery, the big difficulty is how do, even broader than the Jewish and Gentile categories, this, is, this actually becomes the heart of Christian moral philosophy. How do two people, one of whom thinks they've earned it, and the other one is convinced they can't possibly earn it, end up in a relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who can say, you are mine, not by anything that you've done. How is that possible? This is the mystery that Paul sees unfolding through our redemption. How do these people who want nothing to do with being blessed by God get blessed? How are they called favored? How does this work? I want to take you back to the ant farm. You ready? 
This Professor Gordon from Stanford is like her only thing. She loved studying how ants interact. She learned this. In a colony, when, when you've got uh, an ant farm and it's closed off, there's no queen in there. It's a death sentence. The ants are going to die. I'm sorry, those of you, if your kid's here and you've got ants, ant farms at home, they're going to die, okay? Here's what happens. <clears throat> The ants live in a closed system. They communicate by scent. When they go out and they find food and they pass by another ant inside the tunnels, the other ant detects a different scent and then that's the signal that they use to then go out. If you're an ant expert and I'm wrong, please don't. Don't jump in now. Now's not the time, right? Later, you can tell me. But here's what happens. In an ant farm, nobody's scent ever changes. Nobody goes anywhere. So what they do is they continue to move sand or dirt from place to place inside the ant farm pointlessly. As they die, the other ants take their carcass and move it away from the colony in the corner. And what this researcher said is she said, the last ant doesn't work at all. The last ant just sits there knowing that nothing of substance is ever going to happen to them. They're never going to interact. They're never going to detect a different scent. They live in what this researcher called a feedback loop. My friends, the challenge that Jesus overcomes, that Paul applies through redemption, is that without some outside force coming in, and giving us a way to be declared righteous though we have earned none of it, whether we are the do-gooder or the do-nothing. Without that happening, we cannot be blessed. But God brings his favor into the system by the death of his son, and as Paul says here in verse 7, applied by redemption, poured, covered in the blood. When that happens, something has broken into the system, and instead of just working perfecting your technique, getting working harder and harder and harder, but that feedback loop produces nothing, no different sense, no, no different anything. You just eventually die. Instead of that, everything changes in Christ. There's a pattern. The Bible's full of them. God takes people who were made to love him and can't. And he casts his favor on them so that they can be what they are not by nature. That's the story of the Bible. If you're a fan of the Ramones, you might not know how this fits. There's two ways that a song gets stuck in your head, but one of the primary ways that musicians know is by repetition. The Ramones, I Want to Be Sedated, uses the same guitar riff 64 times in that song. It is banging, both. It's, it's a great song, but also it hits you hard again and again and again and again and again, and the idea is you can't miss it. You can't miss the point. This didn't start with Jesus. In the Old Testament, God's people were given two very important messages. The first was the Shema. If you've ever heard of it, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. You've heard this before. There's a second message, the blessing, the Aaronic blessing that was given to God's people regularly. You will hear it this morning when we close the service, which is this. The Lord bless you and keep you, and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The oldest priestly blessing. The mystery is, how do people, deeply flawed, who can't possibly love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength, also get called the people who bear God's favor? Now I want you to consider this. There were times when they heard both of those things. And when they heard them, they were covered in blood. Part of their priestly temple experience was to have the priest take and sprinkle the blood on them to signify their forgiveness. So they would stand there together, full of all that they couldn't do on their own, okay? 
as messed up as you and I will ever be. They were not more righteous than us. At heart, they were human beings. Standing there, being told that they were created for this love relationship, knowing that they're spiritually adulterous. And hammer and anvil again and again and again by the blood. By the blood, that's how by redemption, promised, and will be fulfilled in Jesus. They were told constantly, by the blood of the coming Messiah, you will be my people. You will bear my favor. It's incredibly powerful. It is the primary message that the Christian church has to give in the world. It is the key that fits into the tumbler of mystery by which all the little tumblers fall and the door opens. This is how it happens. This is the beautiful, beautiful truth of the gospel. Without something like that, without the blood of Christ, all we're doing is moving sand escalating moral living. We're doing everything we can like addicts. You know, man takes a drink, the drink takes everything else. That's how we live our lives, just doing and hoping and praying without any hope. Instead, we have this redemption. The mystery has to be revealed from the outside. Jew and Gentile, become daughters and sons of the same faith. One works hard to be blessed. One can't believe they could ever be blessed. And yet they're equal parts, equal partners in grace through Christ. Man, that can only happen through the gospel. That's it. So the question is, if that's true, and it's that, that's the only way that we can be delivered from that feedback loop, eating never full, working never accomplished, right? Partying never free. The only way to be freed from that is in Christ. The question is, what happens next? What happens next is that that wisdom, that way of life, that skill, being schooled in our redemption, changing our hearts, making us more gracious, more obedient to Christ, it also makes us more enthusiastic about being a part of the mending of a broken world. That last part, joining together things on earth, things in heaven, that that message of reconciliation, not just in Colossians, Ephesians, Galatians, Hebrews has a very prominent statement about the same thing. So the question is, what does it look like when the church becomes that community, right? Pardon me for getting, I'm, I'm fired up about this because this picture of the church is the hope that's gonna carry us all the way through this book. Now, I... I'm warning you, this is, a, this is an illustration that I'm sure you've heard. It's like whatever Lord of the Rings thing. Aslan is something, I don't know, whatever. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard this, okay? It's okay. The, the pottery making technique of kintsugi, or kintsugi, it's, 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 it's really a powerful illustration of this, and I can't improve upon it, so I'm telling you. Uh, some people do this intentionally, but at, at any rate, what happens is that you have these broken pieces of pottery. It dates back to the 15th century, uh, and what would happen is they would take the broken pieces, and they would take uh, a resin that they would use to mend the pottery, right? So you imagine you got the broken pieces, you got the resin you'd use to, to fix it, and they would mix that in with gold powder. So as you mixed it together, the, the mending resin was gold. And then you'd, you'd mend the thing, and what happened is this pot actually became, it became valuable, not for its wholeness and not for its breaking, but for its mending. That at all the broken places, that's where the glory was found, okay? And the church is the same way, friends. If we are moved by God's redemptive work in our lives, if we're moved by that, if it changes us, we become crazy evangelists for broken things being made whole. That's what happens. In the church, it's not the glory of the pristine never broken. 
And it's not the glory of the broken never mended. You know, the kind of wallowing in the I'll never be able to do A, B, you know, whatever. It's actually in the mended being made whole that the church sees its great glory. That when we stand before the Lord, and you can read this in Revelation 7, there is a, a community of broken, suffering, hurting people of all kinds. And there's this great line where, where the angel asks, where are these ones from? And the response is, oh Lord, you know. And they get to go and they get to dip their robes in the waters of God's mercy and be made clean. That glory of the broken being made whole, the joining together, is what we do. That's our thing. That's the church's thing before it's anyone else's. We get to be excited about that. We get to major in that. That becomes our craftsmanship. That's the stuff that we just do. And that also means that in your relationships and your deeper relationships and the stuff that's all around you, you anticipate and expect brokenness. You expect it. Marriages that can weather deep betrayal and frustration because the standard is repentance and faith, not perfection. Children who grew up not grinding themselves to death for your approval. Why? Because the standard is not perfection. It's repentance and faith. It's being mended together. It's an incredible, beautiful thing. Now, I'm going to tell you just one last thing. Well, first, let me apply it this way, okay? I'm going to give you a little bit of homework. You want to know how to grow in this wisdom, how to cultivate this skill so that you might be part of God's great mystery reveal in the world, okay? Let me give you some encouragements here. I'm going to get you to dig into the, mis uh, the mystery. I'm going to give you three ways. And if you do these three things, you'll be okay, right? No, I'm just kidding. See, it's good. Some of you are getting it. Okay. But let me tell you the three things. Three pieces of homework. One, study Philippians 2, 12, and 13. Now, here's one of the most poorly often, most poorly exegeted passages in Scripture. Because people often take the first verse, verse 12, and they don't read it in light of verse 13, which is a very important verse in this question. Okay? And I want you to see if you can see here, even here, the mystery being revealed. How is God taking somebody who is called to love him well, he doesn't do it, and how does he call them favored? What happens? Paul's basically saying, marvel at this thing and how it works, okay? So I want you to look at that. If you have questions about it or you want to talk about it or you want to send me, you know, your great answer, and you're like, ah, I, want, I want to get the pastor to tell me this is good, you know? That's fine. You can send that to me too. I'm glad to read it. I'd love it. Here's the second thing, number two. On your list of things to buy, read, whatever, discuss with a friend, I know it's dangerous to recommend books, okay? Um, but I will tell you this. Uh, this little book, Prodigal God, one of my very favorites for uh, helping us understand how God uses the Jew and Gentile dynamic to express deep love for the gospel, okay? And um, one thing that you can do that I'd recommend, especially if your husband and wife Take this book and like take turns reading a chapter a day out loud to each other. Uh, they're short, good for discussion. It's a really powerful and helpful book. All right, third one. <clears throat> we have to get better. <laughs> now, this is a technique thing, kind of, right? We have to dig into the story of our own redemption. It's a good practice to be able to express the hope that you have and why you have it your rescue story, your salvation story, whatever that is. I want you to work at it. I want you to dig into it and recognize when you dig into it that it's so beautiful that all wisdom grows from that and affects all of life. That's where to start, okay? Dig into that history, that story, and be able to tell it, be able to express it. And if you get to a point where you're like, you know what, I really don't know how to answer that. Like I'm, not, I'm not even sure I could point to something. I don't want you to feel, you know, panicked about that, okay? I want you to feel free to reach out. You want to talk about it some more? I'd love to sit down and talk with you more about that. I'm sure our elders, our deacons, our deaconesses would love to sit down and hear your story and talk to you about it, okay? All right, so just three things. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, end here. This whole 
joining together of heaven and earth. I had a, a really great opportunity to see this in action uh, about two weeks ago. So many of you know uh, Don Cameron, who is one of the first elders of this church. And uh, I had the opportunity to go to a funeral where I uh, basically knew no one and didn't know Don, right? I'm there with our people, some of our people who went. And uh, something incredible happened. So you're hearing this story about Don. It's a beautiful story of how he was a part of this church's growth and, and, and uh, all of that stuff. But they, the pastor played a recording. And it was a recording from early in, I don't know if you remember this event, it was called uh, COVID, right? If you don't know what it is, ask a friend, I don't know. At the beginning of COVID, they had a Zoom meeting because that's what we did back then and now and forever. But in that Zoom meeting, they were starting to talk about what to do as a church. And here's what I want you to think about. They're having this conversation in the shadow of semi-trucks being used as freezer trucks in the city. You know what I mean. They're having this meeting in the shadow of some really hard things taking place. And what they choose to do is sing a song. And the pastor at that time, his, his pastor, asked Don to sing a song, pick a song. And Don, Don sings, Ferris, Lord Jesus. Now, in COVID, <laughs> Ferris, Lord Jesus, ruler of all nations. How do, you, how do you sing that when everything's falling apart? That is the unique place where Christians can live. Things as they are on earth, yet touching the things of heaven at the same time and bringing them together. We were hearing this warbly recording of a man who had never seen Jesus but was at that moment in the presence of Jesus, singing about Jesus to other people who had never seen Jesus but really want to see Jesus. It was the longest, long-distance phone call possible between us and Don Cameron at that moment, and yet stunningly local. Hit me right in the heart. The ability to sing about heavenly hope in the middle of earthly trial. Not pretending that bad things don't happen, but yet believing that God is unfolding and revealing a mystery that will redeem and reconcile all things to himself, even the hurting, broken, painful, grievous things. That is your unique story to tell church. It is our unique privilege to live it. So let's do that. Let me pray for us.